Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Does George Washington still matter? Best-selling author Nathaniel Philbrick argues for Washington's unique contribution to the forging of America by retracing his journey as a new president through all 13 former colonies. Travels with George marks a new first-person voice for Philbrick, weaving history and personal reflection into a single narrative. In the fall of 1789, George Washington, only six months into his presidency, set out on the first of four road trips as he attempted to unite what were, in essence, 13 independent states into a single nation. In the fall of 2018, Philbrick, his wife Melissa, and their dog Dora set out on their own series of road trips as they retraced Washington's route across the country. Again, the new book is Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy, and it is a great pleasure to welcome Nathaniel Philbrick back to the book show. How are you? I'm great, and it's really great to be back. Wonderful to uh, have you back on the program. So let's talk about the origin story. Ultimately, this starts with John Brown's chariot. Right, right. I was on a research trip to Providence when I went into the John Brown House, which is this brick magisterial mansion uh, on the east side of Providence. This is John Brown, uh, the one of the founders of Brown University, not the <laughs> emancipator. And uh, uh, he had this uh, chariot in the back that has been uh, meticulously uh, refurbished. And there's a family tradition that when George Washington, as president, was visiting Providence, John Brown gave Washington a ride in his chariot to look at the ship he was building at his shipyard. And uh, looking at this tiny little chariot, I mean, it's the size of a, uh, the backseat of a VW Bug on four skinny <laughs> wheels. I said, wait a minute, what was a president doing in Providence just a, a year after being inaugurated. What was going on here? And that's when I learned about Washington's uh, series of journeys once he became president, in which he visited as many towns throughout the country as possible in an attempt to create a sense of national unity. One of the things that's interesting, and I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but this is August 1790, and the fact that the president would even go to Rhode Island was in question. Absolutely. I mean, Rhode Island was the prodigal state. It was the last state to ratify the Constitution. It hadn't even participated in Washington's election. And when Washington learned that Rhode Island had belatedly ratified the Constitution, he did what I think would be a surprising move today. He embraced uh, the the former opposition and, and immediately jumped on a schooner, sailed up the coast to Newport in Providence and succeeded in turning some of the biggest doubters when it came to the legitimacy of, of his government to some of his biggest fans. As I mentioned in the introduction, you took the trip in the fall of 2018, or at least began it then. You write, little did I know that in the months after our return from our travels, the country would be gripped by two extraordinary events. First, a global pandemic that made the freedom of movement we had once taken for granted impossible, quickly followed by a demand for social justice that inspired protests across the country and the world. Suddenly, the original sin of slavery was no longer at the periphery of the conversation. It was the conversation. Even more, even more than had been true before, the merits of the Founding Fathers were being questioned, which is all for the good, but questioning should never lead to forgetting. But that idea of slavery and that original sin of slavery was something in your mind even prior to those events and, and your return. Absolutely. It was one of the premises, uh, the, one of the lead premises with which I wanted to take this journey. You know, Washington was obviously a slaveholder, and he had this central role in the establishment of uh, this country. I wanted to, I didn't want to let him off the hook in any mm -hmm. way. I really wanted to understand as best I could, you know, his personal, his official, his professional relationship with the slaveholding question. And so I think the book, um, it, it's a theme through, it was going to be a theme throughout the book. But given what happened uh, while I was writing it, it seemed to take on this urgency. It was like this white-hot vector <laughs> pointed at the center <laughs> of this country. And so it, it, it turned uh, what was you know, going to be a preoccupation into kind of an obsessional part of, of our journey. I want to get, as I said, I want to get just to the origin story, and then we'll talk about the actual travels. But, of course, Washington is a big inspiration for the trip. 
But so is John Steinbeck in Tribals with Charlie because, right. well, you're going on a road trip and you're taking your wife and dog. Right. This was uh, Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie has always been one of my favorite books. Uh, my wife and I had the honor of meeting Elaine Steinbeck. Steinbeck's widow uh, on Nantucket years ago, and I had asked her about what it was like uh, when her husband embarked on his tour of America with uh, his his dog Charlie with him, and she said his health wasn't good. I was really worried about him, but when he, sa- he said he was going to bring Charlie, I knew it was going to be okay. And and what I wanted to do was I, you know, I think we have a we can take ourselves our history too seriously sometimes. And what I loved about Travels with Charlie was it, the tone, uh, very flexible, where you know he's he can be extraordinarily serious, but he can also he's also having fun with it. And that's really what I hoped to do with this journey was um, to to go into the darkness, but also to see the light, to see some of the potential uh, this country has, uh, no matter how many problems uh, plague us today. Another inspiration was also Bess and Harry Truman. Yeah. Harry Truman uh, is no longer president. Uh, he and Bess out there in Independence, Missouri, decide to go on a road trip to New York and uh, no security detail. They head out in their big black Chrysler and, you know, <laughs> off they go. And you know, they go into a diner and get recognized. Suddenly people are showing up. A uh, local police force comes over and says, can we help you? No, no, we're fine. And off they went. And so, you know, this was, they were a couple having a good time on the road. And, and uh, Melissa had just retired uh, from her job as a leader of a nonprofit on Nantucket. She had some time for the first time in 35 years. You know, we were going to hit the road together, just like Harry and Bess. Steinbeck writes in uh, Travels with Charlie, I knew very well that I rarely make notes, and if I do, I either lose them or can't read them. I also knew from 30 years of my profession that I cannot write hot on an event. It has to ferment. I must do what a friend calls mule it over for a time before it goes. Yes. Does that hold for you as well? Uh, no. I need to write down what I've experienced. And uh, it made for, you know, we would have uh, uh, fairly intense days where we would meet with local historians, uh, people in each town that uh, n- knew something of, of Washington's visit. And we'd sometimes even give us tours of the town. We talked to various people. We met along the way. And every night I would write down those conversations, those notes, and then we'd be off in the morning. And so I would record those, uh, and, you know, and which I think is a little more of a traditional journalist's approach. Remember, Steinbeck was a novelist, and he right. has been accused of kind of making up <laughs> a lot of travels with Charlie. But hey, Steinbeck's a novelist. I think the truth of what he experienced is there in that book. I'm a journalist by training, so that's the route I took. So before we move on to the body of the trip, let me just ask you, uh, because Steinbeck writes a lot about people asking what degree of dog is that. (laughs) Yeah. You have a a duck tolling retriever. Right. A Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. A unique dog. And uh, uh, Steinbeck traveled with a standard poodle, which is a unique dog as well. And no one ever asked us what degree of a dog was that. They'd say, what kind of dog was that? And I'd say, a toller. (laughs) And they say, what's a toller? Uh, a Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever. A trolling? No. To- anyways, it would go on and on. And so um, <laughs> it was a conversation starter, but it was often a circular conversation that really didn't go anywhere. Nathaniel Philbrick is our guest on the book show this week. The new book, Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy. He knew what he wanted to accomplish out of this trip, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. He would just, a not even a month after he took office, he wrote a letter uh, to John Adams that would be circulated throughout the cabinet proposing uh, that he wanted to go on a road trip, a, a, a tour of New England to get out of the office avoid being isolated, uh, to talk to people, to learn about the people. It was now his job to lead. And so he knew what he wanted with that. He also really wanted to, to make people understand that there was a new order with the Constitution. There was, it wasn't the governors who had all the power, which had been the case under the Articles of Confederation. There was now an executive. Uh, there was a president. And so he was learning 
but he was also instructing in a way. And uh, so he, he had a clear agenda. He was the most popular man in the world uh, in the late 18th century. And he hoped to use that popularity to create a sense of national pride, to create a government that would um, ultimately outlive him. And and it would be a, a government of laws that would be bigger than any single individual. You're right toward the beginning of the book. One could imagine that at some point in his new quarters in New York City, exhausted and overwhelmed, what he must have asked himself had he gotten himself into. I think of that really for anyone who's running for president. Right. Of what did you get yourself into? But to be the first one to do it. Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine, as I say in the book at one point, that to be haunted by the past is bad enough, but to be the first, particularly the first precedent-setting president of the United States, is to uh, bear the weight of the future upon you. Um, you know, that's, that's a crushing responsibility. And Washington was a very reluctant candidate for president. He did, really did not want to do this. Uh, but there really was no one else out there who could do it. And so he very reluctantly said, OK, I will do this. And once he decided to do it, he did it with his full heart and, and uh, energies. But it almost would kill him. Uh, he would begin to suffer uh, illnesses from the very beginning of his presidency. And it became clear to him that uh, you know this was not going to be good for his health, but he'd see the thing through. When it comes to his journey and your journey, obviously a lot has changed in the intervening yes. years, so it's it's not a apples to apples comparison, but you you try to stay as true to the legs of the trip that that he did. Yes, from the first we sort of broke it down. There were five journeys if you included his pre-inaugural uh, journey from Mount Vernon to the temporary capital of New York. And so we've mapped that out, uh, the longer ones being New England and the Southern Tour, which was the longest of them all, almost 2,000 miles. It would take him three months. We mapped those out, uh, divided them in half, the long ones. Even before we left, I sent out uh, inquiries to all the historical societies and libraries of the towns he visited, more than 100 of them. I wanted information about how those towns um, remembered Washington. And uh, so I was getting all of this information, and that helped plot who we were going to talk to, scheduled interviews, and then off we went. When you look at what you were going after and what you were uh, accomplishing by visiting these people and going to these places and talking, there is an artifact, there is a, a, an object, and there's also this great lore that right. has built up and then trying to get to, well, OK, but what really happened? Yeah. And you you are fairly successful in trying to trace back some of these things that we have been told about Washington over time that well, well probably aren't true. Right. It's oral traditions, really, yeah. that are such a part of the historical record in a way. You know, there's history, there's the evidence, hard evidence. Maybe it's a, a letter, a diary entry, a newspaper article. And then there's these traditions of, for example, in New England, there was the Washington Elm. Every town had an elm, it seemed, where Washington had paused to catch his breath from this long journey, wipe his brow, enjoy the view of this beautiful New England village, and then move on. And that tree in the uh, late 19th century was this huge flowering oak and a uh, people would call it the Washington Elm. About half a dozen towns in New England have them. The problem with that tradition is that when Washington came through in November of 1789, it was cold. Uh, the leaves were falling <laughs> off the tree, and these huge uh, trees in the late 19th century were mere saplings, if they were there at all. Often with oral traditions, you get what would appeal to people at the time that they're being told, rather than having them spring from from when it actually happened. And so part of the fun of this book was investigating those traditions. Some of them, you know, there is actual evidence that there's a basis for it, but others, they sort of disappear in the fog of a fond memory. How many times did you hear Washington slept here? 
<laughs> every town. I mean, <laughs> you know, and it's a, it's it's a historical joke. You know, he, oh, all sure. that sleeping around. You know, what was he up to? <laughs> you know, by the end of it, Melissa and I were getting <laughs> kind of sick of this and a little angry. You yes. Know? You know, this it's not a joke. This guy was not enjoying himself all the time. He made a point to stay in public taverns. Now, when we think of historic taverns today, we think of a and b with waffles in the morning, you know, right. a nice place to stay. In the late 18th century, these were the roadside motels of his day. The, the beds were horrible, food even worse, flea infested, but he wanted to make a point. He was, there were gonna be no favorites on these tours. He was not gonna stay in the houses of his rich friends. He was gonna stay in the taverns just like everyone else. And so, you know, this was not something he was doing to sort of make a notch on the belt type of thing. This was, you know, each one of these taverns represented another night on the road trying to create a country. When you look at some of these things you write about, the wooden teeth, the dentures, uh, that's fascinating because you, you can actually see them, right? Right, right. They're, and they aren't wooden. They are dentures. Right. But uh, they are at Mount Vernon and uh, where there is a wonderful interpretive center. And there they are, you know, with a spotlight upon them. They're, they're, they're two jaws of, of lead in which are inserted a lot of animal teeth and some human teeth, which may very well be from some of his enslaved workers, which is something to contemplate. And there they are. His teeth problems are another joke that we have about Washington, but they were an agonizing part of his life. There, there was no joke about them, and, and he needed these dentures. He didn't have a tooth in his head by the second term of his presidency, and without dentures, he could not enunciate the words. He could not speak publicly. And so this is something something he needed if he was going to function as president. And so, you know, it's just one of those artifacts that is a part of the story of, of following Washington. And in writing about that, you say, all I can say is that the past is not a pretty place, nor, I need to remind you, is the present, which of course goes well beyond teeth. Absolutely. I mean, what I wanted to do with talking about Washington's teeth, they lead to a fairly dark episode in his life, which has really only recently been uncovered concerning tooth transplants. This was a, a new technique uh, in the eight, late 18th century in which a rich client could uh, pay people to pull out healthy teeth that were then inserted into their jaws with the hope that they would then be transplanted. It almost never worked, but that didn't stop people from trying. And, and there's evidence that Washington did this in, in desperation after uh, the American Revolution, paying some of his enslaved workers for their teeth, which is you know just a d very disturbing thing to contemplate. But once again, it's one of those things I wanted to, to look at squarely in the face uh, rather than to try to put it under the carpet. This was going to be a book in which we look at Washington for everything he is when it comes to the making of this country and when it comes to his actions as a slaveholder. You write about a couple of instances. One is this pursuit of Ona Judge. In that story, we we get an idea of just how well, we get an idea of his thoughts of his slaves. Right. I mean, it's it's a really complicated story when it comes to Washington. There were about 300 enslaved people on Mount Vernon. Half of them were owned by Washington. The other half were owned by the estate of Martha's deceased husband, and they had intermarried. Washington wanted to free his enslaved workers, but they had intermarried with the other group. It was very complicated. And Ona Judge was Martha's house servant. And when the temporary capital moved to Philadelphia, she was able to escape on a schooner uh, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Washington learns that she is there, uses the power of the presidency to reach out to government officials in Portsmouth and ask them to assist him in, in bringing Ona back. To their credit, uh, they interview her, but they, they do not assist Washington, saying when it becomes clear, she simply wants to be free. She was not taken against her will, which is the impression that Martha and Washington mm. had been under. Even as Washington is pursuing Ona Judge at the end of his life, he's drafting the will in which he will free his enslaved workers. And so these are two in, irreconcilable actions when it comes to slavery and Washington. But you know, this is the nature of human personality. This is someone who was enslaved, who was a owned uh, 
his first slaves came to him when he was 11 when his father died and he inherited them and by the end of his life he had realized that slavery was a pernicious institution that was not compatible uh, with his quest for a union he he really realized that and yet he was so personally entangled and so with this i think this tortured relationship with slavery it's it's for me it's kind of a, almost a metaphor for our tangled relationship with our country's past and with washington no matter uh, you know what you think of him he is there at the beginning uh, with all of these things attached to him and and we have to look at him we can't ignore the fact that he was there if we're going to understand where how we got to where we are now we have to look at washington in all of his complexity and paradoxes to get at the heart of America. Even though some of this obviously is seen as heartless, you you do say, but by freeing his slaves after his death, he did something that not a single other slaveholding founding father felt obliged to do. That's true. I mean, it's a remarkable, there are very few people who can question the, the preconceptions of their growing up. Washington did that. He didn't entirely free himself of them. And, you know, one of the amazing things about Washington's freeing his enslaved workers, which was a very unpopular move in the South, I mean, it was roundly condemned. Uh, and yet what happened was uh, many of those enslaved, those enslaved workers that were freed formed the nucleus of a free black community in Fairfax County that was unlike any community anywhere uh, in the South prior to the the Civil War. And so Washington had created something that was unique by that action. It wasn't just a symbolic action. It actually changed the lives of some people for the better. The relationships that he has along the way in the telling of the story is fascinating to me. Uh, John Hancock, right. not not a great guy <laughs> as far as Washington was concerned. No, they, they, they didn't get along. Uh, it went way back uh, to the se- Second Continental Congress when Washington became commander of the Continental Army. Hancock believed he should have been. So they, you know, it was always a little testy between them. And when Washington comes to Boston, uh, Hancock is governor of Massachusetts, and Hancock had invited Washington to stay with him. Washington says, I can't. I've made this policy of staying in public taverns. Hancock didn't like that. And when Washington arrived in town to huge, thunderous acclaim, Hancock doesn't show up. He claims the gout is keeping him at home. And Washington takes note of this. Uh, when he returns to his quarters, he writes Hancock a letter saying Hancock had invited him to dinner and Washington had agreed to come to dinner. But he said, I will not be coming to dinner. Um, you know, it's up to you to come to me first. Sorry. Uh, Hancock realizes he's grossly miscalculated uh, and says, writes him another letter. I'll be there any second now. He arrives, with great drama, carried by two servants with red felt wrapped around his aching legs, you know, uh, risking death to come here. And he says, my apologies, you know, I am, I am here. And, and Washington says, okay, fine, I'll come to dinner. And what's he, what Washington was doing is, you know, before the Constitution, the governors were the most powerful people in the country. Now it's the president. And Washington made that obvious to everyone by not accepting John Hancock's invitation. You know, it's ludicrously obvious to us today, but only because Washington made sure uh, it was going to be the way it is now. And the other black hat wearing character in the book, I guess, is Jefferson, who at one point you say, unlike Jefferson, Washington didn't need to be right all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Jefferson was brilliant. I mean, there's just absolutely no denying that. But he is secretary of state under George Washington, you know, a prominent member of his cabinet. As Washington is away on a southern tour trying to unite the country, Jefferson with James Madison, you know, a congressman from Virginia, are, are embark on organizing the political resistance, what will become the opposition party, the, the Republican Party, the Democratic Republicans. And so they go on their own tour to the north, up to Albany, ultimately to Vermont, uh, which is now a new state, meeting with anti-federalists, including Aaron Burr. And so even while Washington is in the process of trying to bring things together, you know, there is someone in his own cabinet trying to un- 
you know, trying to split it apart by creating what will be the two-party system. And, mm. and so even Washington was unable to prevent the country from dividing politically. But what he had been able to do was create a nation strong enough to contain that kind of division. You write toward the end of the book, Steinbeck had traveled the country in search of the meaning of America. What he had discovered, that Americans are much more American than they are Northerners, Southerners, Westerners, or Easterners, was exactly what Washington had hoped to accomplish by his own travels. And as Melissa and I could now testify, despite all that had happened in the 60 years since Steinbeck's journey, what he called the American identity was still an exact and provable thing. Yeah, I mean, that was the remarkable thing for us. I mean, this was a time of division in the country. Um, You know, it was there, but when we were following Washington, going to all these little towns, talking to people, it wasn't our differences that struck us. It was how uh, much united us still, uh, you know, when you look at it on terms of people's daily lives. And so, uh, yes, we went down to Augusta, Georgia. You know, we went up to uh, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. But everyone was considered themselves Americans. Um, and, and I think this is the greatest tribute you can give to uh, the success of what Washington attempted to do when he set out on his own road trips to unify this country. We were talking about the war earlier, and we'll, we'll end with this, but you grapple in several at several times during the book about whether this was said or not, but of Washington being just a man. Right. Everywhere we went, it seemed, particularly in New England and even in the South, there were these traditions in which either Washington or a child who had just met him stared up at Washington and said, he's only a man. And Washington would nod and say, yes, I am only a man. And initially I thought, what is it? This is just too good to be true. But we kept hearing it from very different sources. And I think that really was his point. Yes, I am George Washington. I won the American Revolution. I'm probably the most popular man in the world, but I am just like you. I am only a man. This was the message he was trying to deliver. He was trying to create a nation of laws that would transcend the ego of any one person. He was only a man. The name of the new book is Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy by Nathaniel Philbrick, our guest on this week's book show. The book is published by Viking. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program. Bookmark us for next week. And thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donahue.